Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. Deuteronomy chapter number 30. If you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God. Deuteronomy and chapter number 30. Deuteronomy and chapter number 30. We're still moving forward in our series of the millennial kingdom, the thousand year reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we took some time at the beginning of the series to define terms, to explain what we mean, to make sure that we had the same definitions. Then we moved on to the timeline leading up to each event leading up to the millennial kingdom. And now we're in a section where we're dealing with the nuts and bolts of the millennial kingdom, starting to describe the terms. And we took some time to explain that the Old Testament covenants lead a foundation, a basis for all of the understanding and the fulfillment of the millennial kingdom. So because of that, we are now taking time to explain these four Old Testament uh, covenants to take each one of them to explain what they meant to the Hebrew people and see how they are meant to be a future fulfillment, even in our future, that will be finally fulfilled within the millennial kingdom. We had started off with the Abrahamic covenant. We hit that on Wednesday. And now we're going to be moving to the second covenant inside of timeline order that God had given to the people building off of the Abrahamic covenant, something that is commonly called the Palestinian covenant or the land covenant. With that, if you don't mind, look with me in the book of Deuteronomy chapter number 30. The book of Deuteronomy chapter 30, and notice with me if you don't mind, in verse number one. Deuteronomy chapter 30 in verse one. And it shall come to pass when all these things are come upon thee, the blessings and the curse, which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations, whether the Lord thy God hath driven thee, and shall return unto the Lord thy God, and shall obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children, with all thine heart and with all thy soul. Then or that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee and will return and gather thee from all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. If any of thine be driven out unto the uttermost outmost parts of heaven. From thence will the Lord thy God gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thou, thy fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it. And he will do thee good and multiply thee above all thy fathers. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. And the Lord thy God will put all these curses upon thine enemies and upon them that hate thee, which persecuteth thee. And thou shalt return and obey the voice of the Lord and do all of his commandments, which I command thee this day. And the Lord thy God will make thee plenteous in every work of thy hand, in the fruit of thy body, in the fruit of thy cattle, and in the fruit of thy land for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over thee thee as he rejoiced over thy fathers. If thou shall hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in this book of the law, if thou wilt turn unto the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. And if you don't mind, <laughs> If you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, mark a phrase that we find in the book of Deuteronomy chapter number 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30, and notice with me in verse number 5, where it speaks about the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land. The Lord thy God will bring thee into the land thy land, the land. And with this, as we had mentioned before, we're going to cover what is often called the Palestinian covenant 
or is sometimes called the land covenant. The promise to the Hebrew people that God would return them back to the land. If you don't mind, let's go to the Lord together and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much again for you being a wonderful God. And as we come up to you today, I'm just asking that you would give us grace and that you would give us mercy, that you would help us to get understanding of this passage. And Lord, that you would put things in order, help it to be clear. Lord, for me, I'm asking that you would put my mind and set it in order to be put upon thee, that you would keep it from being distracted. You would help it just to focus on what you've given me to do right now. So the best I know how, I surrender myself to you. I give you my ambitions, my goals, what I want to get accomplished, what I want to see done, and just surrender it all to you and ask that you fill me with your spirit for the purpose that you get your own work accomplished through your word. Help us to be clear, help it to be understandable, and help us to rejoice in the, a God who keeps all of his promises. Thank you for whom you are. And in your name we pray. Amen. Now, as we're still talking about the millennial kingdom, we're building from the foundation and trying to explain the purpose of the millennial kingdom, that the purpose of the millennial kingdom is to fulfill the promises God had given to the Hebrew people. Now, if we understand that the millennial kingdom is meant to fulfill the promises of the Hebrew people, then we at least need to have an understanding of the promises that God had given to the Hebrew people. And so as we begin to explore this idea, the first thing I want to do is show you the listing of this promise. The listing of this promise. Now inside of the book of Deuteronomy chapter number 30, it's in the context now where this is a covenant, a promise that God had given to the people. In fact, hold your finger here, just turn back one chapter. Notice with me in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 29. Deuteronomy chapter 29, and notice with me verse 1, just to show the context of this. Deuteronomy 29 and verse 1. These are the words of the covenant. Remember we explained last time that a covenant is an agreement, a promise. These are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab beside the covenant which he had made them in Horeb. Notice as it goes down the same chapter 29 and verse number 10. Ye stand this day, all of you, before the Lord your God, your captains of your tribe, your, your elders, your officers, with all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, and the stranger that is in thy camp, from the hewer of thy wood and to the drawer of thy water, that thou shouldest enter into covenant with the Lord thy God and into his oath, which the Lord thy God maketh with thee, this day. And then it goes on. And as he begins to explore this promise, we come to chapter 30, which is in the same context where God is giving this covenant, this promise that God is going to give the Hebrew people the land. And he's going to explain the tenets of this covenant. Now, just some more backstory that at this time in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 29, chapter 28, chapter 30, all of this is dealing with the time that the Israel has not gone into the land yet, but they're standing outside Jordan and they're preparing to cross over. Now, as they're preparing to cross over, they're going into a land that none of the people have ever seen before. They're also going into the land with a per leader that they have never tried before. Moses is now going off the scene and has already chosen his replacement. And even though Joshua has been the right hand of Moses for 40 years, he is yet to be the total leader, the captain, the general of the armies of children of Israel on his own. And so they have an untested leader going into a land that they have never gone before. And in this, they're giving some instructions about what to do when they get into the land. Part of it in Deuteronomy chapter 28 is that all of the people are supposed to go into the land once it's been settled. And they're supposed to go into two mountains, Ebal and Gizrim. These are going to be the mountains of blessing and cursing. And what they're going to do as a visual representation is they're going to put half the people on one side of the mountain and half the people on the other side. Now on one side, it is all green and lush as the sun is able to hit it. On the other side, because of the sun not getting to it as often, it's dry and barren without vegetation. And so it's supposed to be a visible representation that here God's going to give some promises. And if you obey them, then you're going to have the blessings and green and lush. 
And if you choose not to obey God's promises, you're going to be over here with, on barren without God's promises. And it was to be a visible representation for the people so they could get it in their mind. If you might say a picture book, they could see, okay, this is what happens if you obey God. Okay, this is what happens if you don't obey God. It was supposed to be a vivid imagery that they were to have in mind. And so chapter thir- uh, 28 gives them this blessings and curses and what they're supposed to do. Chapter 29 goes up and gives them some more preparatory work. And then in chapter number 30, they give this covenant of the promises that God has given to the people concerning the land. And as we look at the promises back in Deuteronomy chapter 30, there are going to be several different points going up to this completion of the promises. The first part is the first promise is to gather the scattered Israelites in the world. The first part, the first tenet, the first uh, um, (laughs) idea of this promise is that they were to gather, God was going to gather all the scattered Israelites in the world. Notice with me back in Deuteronomy 30 and verse 1. Deuteronomy 30 and verse 1. And it shall come to pass when all these things were come upon thee, the blessing and the curse. Remember, we had mentioned that before, the blessing and the curse, which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations, whither the Lord thy God hath driven thee. And thou shalt return unto the Lord thy God and shalt obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children with all thine heart and with all thy soul. Then that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee and will return and gather thee from all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. And if any of thine have been driven out to the uttermost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee and from thence will he fetch thee. Now, This is speaking specifically of a future tense event. Now, at the time that this is being recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 30, Israel's one together, all together in one place. They're not scattered. They're one big congregation together, all getting ready to cross into the promised land. So at the moment, they're not scattered. So when are they going to be scattered? What's going to happen? Well, we know that they are going to go into the land and they're going to conquer the land. We have that recorded in the book of uh, Joshua. Then in the book of Judges, the people turned away from God. There arose up another generation after Joshua that did not know the Lord thy God. And so these people grew up and instead of following God and in following his commandments, that every man did what was right in their own eyes. And so because of this, God had to send oppressors over and over to try to get their attention, to try to get them to the place where they would have to draw back to God and answer God's (laughs) to realize that they need God in the first place. Well, eventually the people got the big idea that they got tired of trying to find God's will for themselves. That was the whole thing of uh, the book of Judges is that the people had to go to God for themselves to find out what God would want them to do. But they found that was way too hard. They would rather for someone to tell them what to do. That's always easier. If I could just get someone to tell me what to do. And so they wanted a king just like the rest of the nations. A king that would tell them what to do so they didn't have to put forth the work and the effort to find God's will for themselves. And so God gave them a king after their own heart by the name of Saul. And they found out that Saul was not quite what they wanted at the very end. Then God ended up giving them a king after God's own heart by the name of King David. And King David ruled over the people fairly wisely. After King David, there came another son who ruled after him, the wisest man who had lived, Solomon. And Solomon ruled for 40 years. However, Solomon began to drift away from God and he didn't raise his son Rehoboam correctly. So what happened is that Rehoboam made a foolish decision. And because of the foolishness of Rehoboam, the kingdom of Israel was divided into two. You had the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. 
as time went on, Israel had 18 kings. All 18 of those were wicked and evil. And because they decided not to follow after God, God had the Assyrian Empire come and destroy the nation of Israel in 722 BC. When God did that, the Assyrian nation took the people that were in the land and they transplanted them throughout the Assyrian Empire. They scattered them all about and mixed them with people with the idea that if all the people were mixed together, they could could not uh, develop a common language, a common culture. They would be fighting amongst themselves that they could not overthrow the Assyrian empire. Well, the Southern kingdom had 18 Kings, five of them good. However, they also tested God's patience. And after a time, God was done with them. And in 586 BC under the Babylonian empire, the Babylonians came, took the people and scattered them throughout the known world. Well, after 70 years of of um, captivity, God allowed the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, by the way, the idea of a Jewish person is someone from the southern tribe of Judah. The Hebrew people speak of all of Israel as a whole. So the Jewish people are only a part of the Hebrew people. That will be important here in just a bit. But when God allowed the Jewish people to return, only a small fraction of the scattered people came back. So we know that that was not the uh, regathering of the people that God promised. God promised to bring them all back. And so a small amount came back and they rebuilt the temple and they rebuilt the um, <laughs> tavern, uh, the walls, and they began to establish Jerusalem again. Now this time is only the tribe of Judah or the Jewish people. Well, the Jewish people began to thrive and they began to scatter out even more. And finally, when Jesus Christ came, the Jewish people rejected Jesus Christ. And in 70 AD, the Romans came and destroyed the city of Jerusalem once again. This time wiping out the temple, wiping out the people and scattering the Jewish people all over the world and they are still scattered to this day. There are more Jewish people living in the state of New York than the entire country of Israel today. That they are still a scattered people. And so God is speaking about a time where he's going to gather back not just the Jewish people, but all of the scattered Hebrew people back into the land where he promised them. Now we know that this has never been accomplished. We know that Israel re was reestablished as a state in 1948, but once again, the Hebrew people as a whole have never been regathered. This has not yet been fulfilled filled, but God has to keep his word. And we already covered that. God has to keep his word. So we know that this is a future event that God will gather all of the scattered people and bring them once again into the land that he promised. This is the first part of the Palestinian covenant. The land covenant is that God is going to gather the scattered Israelites around the world and bring them to this place. Notice if you don't mind, there's a second promise, a second tenet to this promise, <clears throat> and that is God will restore them, the scattered people, to their own lands. He will rescatter them to their own lands. Notice with me, if you don't mind, in verse 5. And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it. And he will do good and multiply thee above thy fathers. Now we know during this time that God is going to bring back the people back to the lands, not only to the lands that they originally had, but to all of the lands that they originally were promised. When God told the Hebrew people that he was going to give them the land, he gave them the definition of their borders. They would go all the way up to the Euphrates River, that is in modern day Iraq, all the way down to the Mediterranean Sea into Egypt. It would go all the way from the Sinai Peninsula all the way up to Turkey. Do you know that when Israel finally reoccupies the land today, they only have a small little sliver. But when they come back to the land, all of this will be back to the Hebrew people and they're going to have a big chunk of property. Imagine this, if you are pretty good with maps, think about this. One day Baghdad will be a part of Israel. 
One day Damascus will be a part of Israel. One day Saudi Arabia, Rehad, Saudi Arabia will be a part of Israel. And if I have my map correct in my mind, even Istanbul, Constantinople will be a part of Israel. That all of this land will belong to Israel. And they have never occupied the land that God had promised them. This is still a future event when they will occupy all of the territory God had promised them. This is going to be again fulfilled in the millennial kingdom. Where God gathers all of the Hebrew people. Not just the Jewish people. But all of the Hebrew people back into the land. He will bring them and let them have ownership, possession of all of the borders that he had once given to them. Notice we notice a third tenet inside of this promise that God will spiritually regenerate the Jews of that future time. That God will sp- spiritually regenerate the Hebrew people of that future time. Notice with me in verse 6. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed. To love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. Now we know that God is going to use future events to bring the Hebrew people back to himself. We have that recorded in a time that we often call the tribulation. The time of Jacob's trouble. The 70th week of Daniel. It has many names. But remember the whole point of the tribulation is to bring the Hebrew people back to himself. That God is going to be working during that time period for the purpose of drawing the Hebrew people back to himself. Remember that the tribulation is going to have a lead up to a high mark called the abomination of desolations. Remember that the Antichrist is going to make an agreement with the Hebrew people to rebuild their temple. And so they're going to be rebuilding the temple. At the three and a half year mark, right in the middle of the tribulation, when the temple is rebuilt, the Antichrist is going to step into the temple and he's going to declare himself to be God. The Bible calls this high mark the abomination of desolation is referred to in that title in the Old Testament and in the New Testament and various books. This is a big deal. When the Antichrist declares himself to be God, the Hebrew people are going to realize that this guy was not their Messiah and they're going to turn in droves and realize that Jesus was their promised Messiah and they're going to turn to Jesus Christ and their hearts are going to be changed. They're going to accept the salvation that God had promised to them. And of course we explained before in a previous message more of what's going to happen during that tribulation. But that's the main thrust of the tribulation that God is working through events to bring the Hebrew people back to himself. And now once they are saved, remember that the tribulation is going to start with no loss or no saved people. And the millennial kingdom is going to begin with no lost people. Notice if you don't mind in Deuteronomy 30, a fourth idea that God promises to deal with Israel's enemies. God promises to deal with Israel's enemies. Notice with me in verse 7. And the Lord thy God will put all these curses upon thine enemies and on them that hate thee which persecuteth thee. Now we've covered this before but as a reminder that at the end of the tribulation all of the armies of the earth are going to gather together for the purpose of defying God and finally wiping out the Hebrew people. And as they are preparing for this final offensive, that's when Jesus Christ comes down. And us as saints, we're coming back with him and the armies of heaven are going to come down. Remember, we explained that Jesus is going to mount, arrive at the Mount of Olives and it's going to split together. We're going to arrive together in just a word. He's going to melt their faces and kill them. We have the the parable of the sheep and the goats and of the (coughs) uh, wheat and the tares. He's going to separate all of those who are lost. They're going to be judged right then and there. And the millennial kingdom is going to start with no... Uh, no lost people, only people who have accepted Christ as their Savior from us with redeemed bodies or the Hebrew people who survived the tribulation who have now been drawn to God and have accepted him as their Savior. They're going to enter into the millennial kingdom and God promises that he is going to deal with the enemies of Israel once and for all. Notice if you don't mind, there's another tenet to this promise that God gives, that God promises to prosper them greatly. God promises to prosper them greatly. Verse number eight, and thou shalt return 
meaning to the land, and obey the voice of the Lord, and do all his commandments which I command thee this day. And the Lord thy God will make thee plenteous in every work of thy hand, and in the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy cattle, and in the fruit of thy land for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over thee for good, as he hath rejoiced over thy fathers. And in this promise that God's going to gather them back to this land. He's going to gather them from the places they've been scattered. He's going to bring them salvation. They're going to accept him as salvation. Then he is going to bring them into a place where God is going to bless them. This is going to be a place where they rejoice enjoy God's blessing and God is going to rejoice over them. We spoke about this morning that one of the hallmarks of the millennial kingdom is that rejoicing over and over. It speaks about this great rejoicing and here God is going to rejoice once again over his special people that he has chosen and that he has kept. He has preserved and now he has brought into this land and that the millennial kingdom is the fulfillment of the promises God made to the Hebrew people that he will give them to a land that he promised them and this land will be prosperous. Remember, this is going to be a place where God resets to Garden of Eden conditions. We'll talk about that message in about three Sundays from now about these Garden of Eden conditions. But it will be a wonderful place. All of this because God made a promise to the Hebrew people and God will keep his word. Now that was the first point. Let's cover a second thing. The significance of this promise The significance of this promise. Why is this so important? Well, we know that this covenant was specific to the literal nation of Israel. Not to a simile, not to a picture of Israel, but to the literal people of Israel. These promises include all of Israel, which would include all 12 tribes. Now, some people often refer to the other 10 tribes that are not Jewish as the lost tribes, but God knows exactly where they are. He's never lost track of them. Isn't that a wonderful thing? God never loses track of his people. Sometimes you may feel like you're all alone. Sometimes you feel like, does God even see me? I'm just in this small place. Nobody notices me. God knows where you're at. Isn't that a wonderful thing? He always knows where you're at. He keeps track. He knows where you came from. He knows where you're going and he knows where you're currently at. And God knows where all of these 12 tribes are scattered from and he has not forgot his promises. These promises are not to the Jewish people alone, but to the Hebrew people as a whole. These promises also obligate God to never terminate his special relationship with Israel. Israel. Now this is a big deal that God promised that he has to keep his word with Israel. Now we explained this a little bit on Wednesday that because God made a promise to the Hebrew people and Satan knows this, he is doing everything he can to wipe out the Hebrew people because if there are no more Hebrew people, then God can't keep his word. But God promised he will keep them and preserve them. And so (coughs) we know that there's a spiritual background (laughs) and a special relationship they have. But God will never terminate or end this relationship. Remember we had spoken about on on Wednesday about the Abrahamic covenant. And we took times to, to explain from Genesis 15 the ceremony that God had Abraham set up. Remember today that we have to have things notarized or we have to have it in triplicate and papers to make sure that this, hand, uh, that this deal was across. You can't just take a handshake. Back in those ancient world, what they did is they had a special ceremony where they would take the sacrificed animals and put part on one side and part on one side. And normally what what would happen is those two people would walk together in the path that was made to show that this is an agreement. It was a special ceremony. But if you remember in what we talked about on Wednesday, that God put Abraham to sleep and that God in those two lights walked through the path. And that tells us that God made an agreement with himself concerning Abraham. That God didn't make a promise to Abraham. He made a promise to himself concerning Abraham. 
And what does that mean? That God promised to carry out these promises to Abraham, which the land covenant is an extension of the Abrahamic covenant. It's built on that understanding. That means that the Jewish people cannot forfeit their right. God made a promise to himself about Israel. Israel doesn't have a say in it. That means they could rebel if they want to, and they have. They could reject him if he wants to, and they have. But God says, I don't care. I'm still going to keep my word because I made the promise to myself. What that tells us, and we have to make sure we understand, is that Israel has not been replaced. We know that today there is uh, many books and many theological ideas that white Christian America and England has replaced the Israelites We have not. God has made promises to us as Gentiles, but the promises that God made to Israel are still binding, that they cannot forfeit, they cannot walk away, and the rejection of Christ did not change it. God made a promise that to the Hebrew people that are specific and non-conditional, they are eternal, God will keep his word. And just like this, this, this land covenant, God will keep his word. He will do what he said of bringing the Hebrew people back to himself. He will keep his word. And we know because this has never been fulfilled. There's never been a time where the Hebrew people have all been gathered together in the land that God had promised them. They have never occupied all of the land that God promised them. So if this is going to be fulfilled and God has to keep his word, this is a future fulfillment for us. And we understand this is part of the millennial kingdom. They also require Israel to survive the curses of Deuteronomy 28. What does that mean? Well, part of the curses of Deuteronomy 28 is that if they disobeyed, they would be scattered around. Has that been fulfilled? Yes. Well, if God fulfilled part of it, doesn't it make sense he's going to fulfill the other part of it? Absolutely. They guarantee Israel's personal ownership of the land. We know that there was an attempt to give Israel the land in 1948, but that was man's attempt trying to mirror God's word. But we know that they're going to be chased off the land and the the tribulation anyways. They're all going to flee. They're going to be hiding. And God's going to bring them back to the land as well as everyone else of the Hebrew people. Literal Israel will end up repenting and getting saved And they will serve Jesus Christ happily inside of the millennial kingdom. We see the significance of this promise. One more thing I want to show you. And that's the character of this promise. The character of this promise. This character of this promise is an unconditional promise. In Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 60. I'm not turning there. Ezekiel 16, 60. God calls this covenant an eternal covenant. Meaning it's something that God is going to keep. It's not going to change. This Palestinian covenant is an amplification and enlargement of this Abrahamic covenant. That God is going to fulfill it because of his character. Because he promised to do so. All of this leads us to the future fulfillment of this promise. The literal fulfillment of this promise includes Israel and it includes that Israel must be converted as a nation. That's a big deal. One of the promises that God put side by side with this land promise is that the Hebrew people are going to be converted. They're going to come to him. They're going to accept him as promise. This goes hand in hand. That God is going to do something in their lives so they get saved. Once they get saved, God is going to regather them and put them in the land. This idea that the Hebrew people will be converted, turned to God willingly, is a very big deal of this land covenant. It's not that God is just going to give them the land. He's going to give them the land as he brings those people to himself. They're going to realize that he was their Messiah. He was their God the whole time. And they're with their heart are going to turn to him. This is a big deal. So the literal fulfillment is that these people are going to get saved. The literal fulfillment is that they're going to be regathered from a worldwide dispersion into the land which Israel then will possess. And they will be the judge uh, witnesses of the judgment of Israel's enemies And they will receive the material blessings God has set aside for. These are all things that must be fulfilled and they will be fulfilled inside of the millennial kingdom. Now this covenant will give influence to the expectation of this fulfillment. What does that mean? 
Well, the prophets, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, would look forward to that literal fulfillment. So when the Hebrew people would go through rough times, the minor prophets are very big on this. So the Hebrew people are going through rough times. Someone's picking on them. Someone's threading them. Someone's surrounding them. And what will happen is that the prophet will take time as God inspires them and directs them. And they'll tell about what God is going to do in that local time. But then they'll also say, guess what? God has something prepared for you in the future. God is going to deliver his promises. God's going to keep his word. This became a great source of hope to the Hebrew people. So think about this. The Assyrian nation is surrounding Israel. Surrounding, uh, they've already conquered Israel and they're surrounding Jerusalem. And now you, what do we do? This big steamrolled military machine that has conquered everywhere. The Nazis of the ancient world are surrounding us. What do we do, God? How are we going to fight them? And God says, I gave you a promise. And they were able to cling to the promise And God was able to deliver them because they said, listen, you said you're not going to wipe us out. You said you're not going to destroy us. You said you were going to protect us. And they were able to use that as promises. You would see this over and over in the minor prophets where they would get their source of hope that, hey, God's going to scatter you. But don't forget, God promised that he was going to bring you back again. He still has plans for you. He still has plans for Jerusalem. And over and over, this is why the reading of the Old Testament is so exciting when you understand the basis of this, that this is what was used to give hope to those people of those times. God has a promise. God's going to bring you back. God has plans for you. He's not done with you. He's still going to keep his word. And it would be a great source of hope, even in their roughest times. What a great savior. In fact, let's just look at a couple, if you don't mind. Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11. I could show you promise after promise after promise, but let's just look at a couple, if you don't mind. Isaiah chapter 11, which by the way is very clearly a millennial kingdom passage. Isaiah chapter 11. How do we know it's a millennial kingdom passage? Oh, just look with me, verse 6. We'll get to our main text in just a second, but just to show it's a millennial kingdom passage. Verse 6, uh, Isaiah eleven six. 6. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid. This is a goat. And the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And the little child shall lead them. Remember the millennial kingdom is going to be a time of peace. And here it is all these animals getting together. Can you imagine that uh, a wolf lying down with a lamb and not trying to eat him? Could you imagine a leopard laying down with a goat? The calf and a young lion hanging out together. And a little child leading them on. This is definitely not here and now. But this is a millennial kingdom passage. Verse 7. And the cow and the bear shall feed. And their young ones shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like an ox. And the suckling child shall play in the hole of the asp. And the weaned child shall put his hand in the cockroach den. How would you like to let your kids play with snakes right now? But in the millennial kingdom, it's not going to be a big deal. So this is clearly a millennial kingdom passage. Go to verse 11. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. And he shall set up an ensign from the nations and shall assemble the outcast of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. So in this millennial kingdom passage, here was a message of hope that God was going to bring all the people back together again. Don't forget that God made you this promise and he will gather the folks again. Notice again in Jeremiah chapter 16. I'm not going to turn to all the passages. I wouldn't have time for that, but I'm just want to show you a sampling how this was used as a source of hope. What was the hope? That God keeps his word. That is a great hope. God keeps his word. Jeremiah 16. Jeremiah 16, if you don't mind, in verse number 14. Jeremiah 16 and verse 14. Therefore, 
Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that it shall not shall no more be said, the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt. Pause. Now, up to this time, the greatest miracle that has been repeated over and over was the parting of the Red Sea. Can you imagine what a big deal that was? Remember, two and a half million Jewish or Hebrew people are standing at this wall of water or at this water. Pharaoh and his army are coming behind them. They are trapped. And God has Moses lift up the staff and the water parts. Now, I know that your mind may be stuck on movies and there's just this narrow pathway. But in order to get two and a half million people across overnight, they had to walk across 3,000 abreast. 3,000 side by side. In order for the that many people to cross, the water had to be parted two and a half miles. That's a lot bigger than a narrow corridor. Two and a half miles, you couldn't even see the end of one from one. That's a big miracle. And two and a half million people crossed on dry land. That's something that can't be explained by nature. It can't be explained by some fan experiment on a model. It was something that God had done. And it was something that the people would go to. That whenever you wanted to talk about a miracle working God. And you wanted to talk about a God who could do anything. You would go back and point to the Red Sea. Now this is saying, hey, remember people used to talk about the Red Sea, but God is going to do something more miraculous that people will talk about that rather than the Red Sea. What kind of event could top the Red Sea parting? What type of event could it be? Verse number 15, but the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands, whether he had driven them, and I will bring them again unto their land that he gave the fathers. What event? is going to top the the miracle of the Red Sea crossing when God brings all the Hebrew people back into one place and he didn't forget a single one. Can you imagine what a miracle that would be? Now we talk about this and our minds kind of kind of okay okay but you understand this is a big miracle because God has to keep track of each one of them. He has to do a miracle to bring them to himself and bring them back to the land and fulfill everything he said he was going to do. And that's going to be fulfilled in the millennial kingdom. And when we get to the millennial kingdom, we're all going to be going, wow, what a God. What a God that he never failed on his promise. He never forgot his people. That he has wonderful things. By the way, this was a source of hope for the people. That they said, hey, God has a future promise that is going to be bigger than that Red Sea crossing. We have a big God who is currently full of power. He hasn't lost his power. He hasn't got tired. He doesn't need a nap. He hasn't run out of gas. This God is still in control. And he still has miracle powers. Notice with me, if you don't mind, to Ezekiel. Again, I'm not going to turn to them all, but I want to show you how this was over and over used as a source of hope. So hopefully when you go back through your Bible reading the next time, especially going through the major prophets and the minor prophets, you look forward to how this promise was given as a hope to the people. Look to God. Look to God. He has future promises to us. He will keep his word. He's going to bring us back to the land. The book of Ezekiel chapter number 11. Ezekiel chapter number 11. Notice with me, if you don't mind, Ezekiel 11 and verse 17. Uh, Start in verse 16. Ezekiel 11 verse um, 16. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, although I have cast them far off among the heathen, and although I have scattered them among the countries, yet will I be able to... um, will I be to them as a little sanctuary in the countries where they shall come. Therefore say, thus saith the Lord God, I will even gather you from the people and assemble you from out of the countries where you have been scattered and I will give you the land of Israel. And they shall come hither and they shall take away all the the detestable things thereof and all the abominations thereof from thence. And I will give them one heart 
and I will put a new spirit within you. And I will take the stony heart out of their flesh and I will give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them. And they shall be my people and I will be their God. Oh, what a wonderful God that God says, I have promises for them. I have things to do for them and I am going to work in their life. And again, you could go through the minor prophets and see every time that they're going through trouble, the minor prophet will usually end with some promise, some reference to the millennial kingdom saying, look, God has promises for you. He's going to keep his word. He's going to preserve you. Now, what does this mean for us? Well, if God promised to keep his word to the Hebrew people that is lasting for thousands of years and he doesn't grow senile and forget about it, that he hasn't misplaced where he put that promise. If God has made those promises to those people and promised to do so, I want to remind you that God has made plenty of promises for you and you could trust him. What is it that you need to trust God for? Remember, as we talked about this morning, that God's word will not return void. We can trust it. We can depend upon it. What is the promise that you need to depend upon? Maybe it's something simple as John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, that includes me, that whosoever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Maybe something like Romans 8, 28, for we know that all things work together for for good to them that love God, to them who are thee called according to his purpose. Maybe something as simple as Romans 10, 17, for faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How do I get more faith? By getting more of the word of God. That's what we need. God has made so many promises for you. Maybe you just need the promise that God said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Maybe you need the promise that he that began a good work in you shall continue against that day. Oh, maybe you need the promise that God, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. What is it? God has so many promises and we could take them to the bank. What is it that you need to trust God for now? What is it that you need to depend upon God for now? We have a wonderful God who will keep his word. And we just needed that reminder. And we could see it here that God has future promises that he will fulfill to the Hebrew people that they can't. Uh, they haven't defaulted on it. They haven't wiped it away. God is going to keep those promises and he promised them. And it was their source of hope. Do you have a source of hope? Are you depending upon God's word? When you get discouraged, do you have something you could pull from from God's word? Is there something you could depend upon that the greatest days are still ahead? That there's more hope in a sick dog than a dead lion? As long as there's breath, there is hope. We need to be a hopeful people. That should be the harm mark of someone who's truly following after the Lord is that we are hopeful people. So many times we have Christians, professing Christians who seem like they're walking around that they've been sucking on lemons too long or they've been soaking in pickle juice. They're just so sour and nasty, so hopeless but we should be a hopeful people. God has so much planned for us and he's going to keep his word. And even if we don't like where we're at right now, just keep your eyes on him and follow after him and trust him. God knows what he's doing. Maybe I should just ask this way. How is your hope? How is your encouragement? You know, if you're able to trust God's promises, you are a hopeful people. Even if things are not where you want it to be right now, trust God's word, take the step of obedience, and trust that God will work. Can you be a hopeful people? That should be the hallmark. When people go to a church like this, they should be able to say, you know what's different about that church? Is that they're hopeful. It shouldn't be, oh, let me tell you about how horrible things are. There are people who went to church today and what they heard from the pulpit is like, well, the last days are upon us and perilous times shall come and men shall be lovers of their own self and they have no hope. We should be a very hopeful people because our God still lives Amen. and our God keeps his word. Amen. Let's look to him the author and finish of our faith, the Christ of our hope.
you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 530-6308. Once again, that number is 920-530-6308. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.